From the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. Venezuela's government has announced that it has fully restored electricity across the country. The Communications Minister Jorge Rodriguez said the government has overcome cyber and sabotage attacks on its power system, which began last Thursday. He added that drinkable water has also been restored to 80% of the country. Work will resume on Thursday and the suspension of classes will be extended for another 24 hours. We want to say that the electricity service has been completely restored in the country. There are still minor problems in places where shifters were sabotaged. We are working to restore the service in the next hours in those areas. The President Nicolás Maduro has announced that Thursday will be a normal working day, including the private and public sectors, businesses, industries, and the service sector. The school activities will remain canceled for 24 hours more. Meanwhile, community organizations are working to restore basic services and to make sure food is available for everyone. The programs that have been providing the most help are the local committees for supplies and production, also known as CLAPS. Let's take a look. In this neighborhood, high in the hills of Caracas, people are waiting for the arrival of a truck full of food for the community. They're expectant but calm, thanks to their long tradition of community organizing. Such organization has been put to the test in recent days with the massive power outage caused by an attack on Venezuela's power grid. The lady sabotage was really bad. We have senior citizens here, but thankfully the Bolivarian government gave us a straight answer. There have been ups and downs, but the issue is being resolved and we continue moving forward. Families are organizing as part of the local committees for supplies and production, also known as CLAPS. They were created three years ago during a state of emergency to face the economic war waged against Venezuela. The CLAPs provide us with basic goods, flour, rice, sugar, grains, oil, pasta, canned tuna. This allows us to go on and keep food on our table. In this warehouse, 35,000 clap boxes arrive daily. From here, they go to 19 of the 24 parishes in Caracas every two weeks. 300,000 families receive their clap box, regardless of whether they support the government or the opposition. The CLAP came together thanks to social organizing, and they were formed to fight the economic war. Thanks to the CLAPs, we have created an efficient distribution system. They help us fight speculation and smuggling. We have managed to move our economy forward by overcoming the economic war. Communities are involved in every part of this process. We are guaranteeing food for my community. We are doing fine, thanks to my commander. People have raised their own consciousness in order to withstand the onset of those who want to see the Bolivarian revolution crumble. The quality of our work has only improved, as has the cooperation between Venezuelans. Following the attack on the country's power grid, the authorities have redoubled efforts to distribute clap boxes. Due to the emergency circumstances, 170,000 boxes will be distributed, of which 95% are financed by the government. A few will want to take this happiness away from us, but they will fail because we are a country of love, of solidarity. We stand together against the war they are desperate for. What they don't know is that we are a conscientious people. Our eyes are open, thanks to Chavez. He opened our eyes. They haven't succeeded yet and will continue to fail. This dense social tapestry that makes up so much of Venezuelan society remains invisible to the mainstream and corporate media. And Venezuelan citizens continue to show their support for the Bolivarian government. Hundreds of people attended an event in Caracas with concerts and political debates. Despite the attacks and the difficult circumstances, supporters say they are keeping their spirits high. A vigil was held Wednesday night in Brazil for victims of the school shooting in Susano. At least five students and two school officials were killed in the attack at Raul Brazil School near Sao Paulo. Police say it was carried out by two former students of the school who then killed themselves. People gathered outside the school last night to remember the victims with a religious service. 
It's with much pain, with much sadness. I think that no one expects this from a young person. Young people should be spending their energy studying, playing sports, not these things. Much sadness, much pain. I think that this act didn't only hurt the victims, but it hurt society, it hurt our city, it hurt Brazil. Everyone is feeling this. Now let's hear from our correspondent in Brazil, Brian Mir, who has more on Wednesday's shooting. On March 13th, two former students of a public school in Suzano, which is an industrial suburb located about 50 kilometers from Sao Paulo, returned to their former place of learning with guns. They opened fire, they killed five students, injured six other students, killed two school officials and a businessman who was on the premises at the time of the tragedy. Then they killed themselves. And this has left their neighbors and their family members stupefied because according to them, they had given no signs that they would ever do something like this. They were regular kids, they liked to play video games, they didn't use drugs. And it reminds people of the travesty that happened in Hialengo, in Rio de Janeiro a few years ago when a similar incident left 10 children dead, and also of the kinds of school shootings that have become unfortunately popular in the United States, which is a country which has very liberal gun ownership laws. Now, the president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, recently issued a decree liberalizing gun ownership in Brazil. So, a big question right now is how is liberal gun ownership laws going to affect these kinds of shootings in Brazil? Also, a report from Brian Mir in Sao Paulo. Now, to other news, search and rescue efforts continue in Lagos Island, Nigeria, after a building with a school inside collapsed. At least 10 people have died and 40 have been rescued. Dozens of children are among those fears still trapped. It's believed about 100 students were in the three-story building when it came down. The governor of Lagos visited the scene and says the school was operating illegally. He blamed the landlord for resisting the government's demolition plan. But for now, we can only talk about the number of people that we have rescued, which is in the excess of 40, and then we are still rescuing more. We also spoke to journalist Deji Badmus in Lagos, who was at the scene earlier. Well, people have been helping. To be candid, I, I must tell you that the rescue situation is a bit chaotic. Uh, chaotic in the sense that a crowd control at the scene is quite uh, very poor. Uh, too many people living around. That place is actually densely populated. Uh, and so uh, most of the rescue is done by the first responders, people around the area who are actually helping uh, the official rescue uh, agencies. But the, the whole process is not well coordinated at all. In any case, uh, people have been brought up. But to be candid, it's, um, it's a bit chaotic and not organized. The area is densely populated, quite difficult to move in heavy duty rescue equipment there. It, it took a lot of time, for instance, to move in one of the heavy duty uh, rescue equipment to, to the site. And, um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really a problem. It, it's a problem and um, it's, it's actually nothing new because that, that area, that area of the city is prone to incidents like this. As a matter of fact, I would say 90% of the building collapse we've had in this city is actually around that area. And, um, and people are wondering why the authorities has actually not done much about that, the, the situation there. The fact is, from, from what we're gathering, that building uh, was actually bad. It was marked for demolition. Uh, we understand the authorities had actually, that's the building control agency in the city, had marked the building for demolition. Now, why they did not demolish the building is, is what no one knows. And why people were still making use of the building after it had been marked for uh, demolition is, uh, is very difficult to tell, but, but it's actually common. It's common to have a, a situation like that where you would have buildings marked for demolition, but the demolition would not be carried out, and then you still have people use the building. So um, We have more stories coming up. We'll be back. Pakistani journalist Tariq Ali examines the mass media influence promoted by imperialism. Get access to the analysis of the socio-economic and political life of the whole South America on our screen and platform in English. A critical place committed to the truth to determine the major events that transform the world today. On Monday, only on Venezuela.
Welcome back. Colombians have rallied in Bogota to demand the peace agreement with the FARC be respected. Demonstrators have challenged President Ivan Duque's willingness to change the agreements. The negotiators of the accord had previously warned that the government could seriously damage it. On Sunday, Duque objected to six articles of statutory law for the special jurisdiction for peace. This is a key mechanism to judge the crimes committed during the internal conflict. Cuba's Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez has reacted to the 43rd Annual Report on Human Rights Practices released by the U.S. State Department. He said that the United States has no moral authority to speak about human rights. He described the U.S. as a global repressor which discriminates against minorities, impoverishes the poor, and violates the rights of immigrants, among others. Activists in Brazil have staged a demonstration to demand justice for Councilwoman Mariel Flanco and her driver, today one year after they were murdered. Two barefoot women wiped the mock blood-stained ground in front of a cage to call for complete transparency in the case. Two former police officers were arrested in connection with the murder. Franco was an outspoken critic of the police and paramilitary militias. The objective is to demand the complete transparency of the murder of the Velaria Marial from the public power. We understand that there are people with a lot of power behind that crime, in addition to executives. We want to know who the intellectual actors of that murder were. Hundreds of women, members of the landless workers movement in Brazil, have occupied one of the farms owned by a religious leader accused of harassing hundreds of women. We have more in this report. Over 800 women from the landless workers movement in Brazil occupied one of the farms owned by the medium, Joao de Duas, who has been accused of sexual abuse and violence against around 500 women and jailed since December 2018. We are in one of the many areas of land owned by Joao de Deus. He is accused of exerting violence against many women during his sessions, so we have come here to denounce his abuse and we want his lands to be given over to the agrarian reform. We also want victims to be recognized and compensated. This year, we are also mobilizing on a national level against the reform promoted by the president. All Capistan women and all working women are standing up against this reform. That clearly goes against this. It's also a special date because of the anniversary of the mother of our comrade, Mariere Franco. From the farm, Don Inacio, in Annapolis, in the state of Goiás, they remember the human rights activist, Mariel Franco, and urged the clarification of the murder last March 14, 2018, and who promoted that political crime. They also criticize the machista view and the backtracking by the current government, the increase in femicides and attacks against agrarian reform. We are going through a really tricky political moment. We have two governments, one that does not accept this kind of protest, and we have a president that also rejects the landless workers' movement. This is a great challenge for us, entering this farm as a conquest. We don't know where all this money comes from, all this abuse against women, and all of the oppression that women continue to suffer. Our occupation, our protest, is a sign that we are fighting for our rights. We demand that the women are respected. Another struggle is agrarian reform. We know how important a her own land is for a woman and her family. In Brazil, the country with the fifth highest number of women being violently killed, they are protesting against misery and inequality. They are calling for the end of the patriarchy. Thousands of people were evacuated from a bank in Mexico City after a bomb threat. Police sent in a team of bomb experts to the offices of BBVVA, the Spanish bank located in one of the capital's tallest skyscrapers, Torre Bancomer. The city's emergency services chief said both emails and phone calls warn of a possible explosive device in the building. The bank representative said in a statement it did not believe the threats were real. In Ecuador, labor unions plan to intensify protests after the IMF approved a $4.2 billion loan. Our correspondent, Denise Herrera, is in Quito with the details. The agreement arrived under the IMF's extended fund facility would also provide support for the government's austerity program. Ecuador's finance minister Richard Martinez has described this new agreement as fruitful cooperation. He has assured that it will protect social spending and the well-being of the most vulnerable. 
This will also restore investors' confidence in the country. It will allow local and international interests to expand their investments. And we're confident this will boost competitiveness and job creation. A path on IMF director Christine Lagarde's Twitter account stated that the agreement will support the government's effort to shore up its finances, including Ecuador's agenda to modernize the economy and create jobs while countering a corruption. The program is expected to pave the way for strong and equitable growth, but do social justice organizations share this view? The International Monetary Fund usually does this type of negotiation in secret. The question here is how legitimate is it? Because we have followed the strategies outlined by an international institution while failing to consider Ecuador's own governance structure and constitutional framework. Nearly 10,000 public officials were fired by the Ecuadorian government between February 27th and March 1st. Labor unions and the workers they represent have called this IMF deal a recipe for disaster. They are vowing to intensify protest action until President Moreno shows respect workers' rights. Denise Herrera, Telesur, Ecuador. Now to Bolivia, its central bank says it will maintain its own policies, which have been far so far a success for the country. Let's find out more. The central bank of Bolivia implemented the counter-cyclical policy. What it means is that the government manages the economy so that the prices of raw materials don't drop and spending is reduced. In times of global economic contraction, we have expanded credit and a policy for reducing interest rates. Adapting measures that go against the norm of economics has proven to be successful for the Bolivian economy. The exchange rate has remained stable, which without doubt favored expansionary policies by generating lower inflation. All of this is contrary to what has been happening to other economies. Because of its counter-cyclical policy, Bolivia is expected to lead in economic performance in the region this year, like it has done for the last five years. We will continue fighting against the adverse effects of economic cycles to avoid undermining our economy. We want to avoid employment and depriving families. A stable exchange rate will persist. We at the central bank are confident about this. In 2019, experts estimate that the country's GDP will grow by over 4.5% because of a nearly $8 billion state investment. The Africa Now Summit has come to an end in the Ugandan capital, Kampala. This year's conference focused on harnessing the skills of African youth to secure the future of the continent. It sought to find African solutions to problems and to develop partnerships. During the summit, the leaders called for greater integration to resolve conflicts. The concept of integration, the whole program of uh, uh, economic blocks and putting ourselves together, does not become a subjective matter to one or two, three leaders who maybe have challenges here and there. Mm. And therefore, it is important for us to have solid institutions as a region where we can have predictability, that it doesn't matter who is elected tomorrow. We're taking one last break. Stay with us. The life is full of moments. Moments of fight. Moments of hope. Moments that present. Moments that you can live in. The Lesur Documentaries. Sundays. Only on the Lesur.
Welcome back. The black boxes from the crash Ethiopian plane have arrived in France. The flight data recorder and a cockpit voice are critical uh, for the case and will be handed over to France to the Air Accident Investigation Agency. This at as authorities work to find out why the brand new aircraft plunged to the ground shortly after take on, taking off, killing the 157 people on board. And at the same time, aircraft manufacturer Boeing has announced that it is grounding its entire fleet of the 737 MAX 8 and MAX 9, pending investigations into the Ethiopian Airlines incident. A statement by the company said the decision was made out of caution and the need to address the public's concern about the safety of the aircraft. Sunday's crash was the second accident involving this model of jet since October. Meanwhile, hundreds of travelers in the United States have been left stranded following the decision. Airlines have, however, assured that all passengers that were booked on the aircraft will be transferred to other flights. Earlier on, during a media briefing, President Donald Trump said planes in the air could fly to their destinations. The announcement comes less than a day after U.S. regulators had insisted the aircraft was safe. We're going to be issuing an emergency order of prohibition to ground all flights of the 737 MAX 8 and the 737 MAX 9 and planes associated with that line. I've spoken to Elaine Chow, Secretary of Transportation, Dan Elwell, Acting Administrator of the FAA, and to Dennis Mullenberg, CEO of Boeing, and they'll be available shortly after our conference today. They are all in agreement with the action. The United States Senate has voted to pass a resolution to end the U.S.-backed war on Yemen. It was passed with 54 votes in favor and 46 against. The resolution was initiated by Senator Bernie Sanders and Mike Lee, among others, who want an end to all U.S. involvement in the war. The conflict has caused one of the world's largest humanitarian catastrophes, according to the United Nations. Women have rallied in the Yemeni capital of Sana'a to condemn the latest airstrikes on Hajia province, which killed 22 people. The group of women protested against the killing of 12 children and 10 women in attacks by the Saudi-led coalition on Tuesday. More than 30 people were also injured in the bombing. Yemen has been facing the world's worst humanitarian crisis since the war began in 2015. Thousands have been killed and more than 2 million people have fled the country. <laughs> Yemeni women came out today to express their anger and to condemn the heinous crime committed by the coalition forces against the women in the Kushar district of Haja province. These crimes are not to be the first and will not to be the last by those who have imposed silence with international complicity. A gas pipeline explosion in Iran has killed at least four people and injured six. A woman and a young child are among the dead. A gas leakage in the pipeline connecting the gas network from the city of Abbas to Mashahar is said to have caused the blast. Fire officials fear the death toll could rise. Out of 17 suspects, only one former British soldier will be prosecuted in connection to the deaths of civil rights protesters in Northern Ireland more than 40 years ago. The incident on January 30, 1972, in London Derry, is known as Bloody Sunday. British troops opened fire during a march where unarmed demonstrators were protesting Britain's detention of suspected Irish nationalists. They killed 13 people and wounded 14 others. The soldier, who will be prosecuted, identified only as Soldier F, will be charged with two murders and four attempted murders. Also in the UK, lawmakers are set to vote Thursday on whether to delay Brexit beyond March 29. This after British MPs passed the so-called Spellman Amendment by 312 votes to 308. It essentially means the UK rejects leaving the European Union without a deal in any circumstance. European Council President Donald Tusk is to ask EU leaders to be open to a long Brexit extension. In a tweet, Tusk suggests 
that this may be necessary if the UK needs more time to reassess its strategy of leaving the EU. EU leaders are scheduled to meet on March 21st to discuss Brexit. The President of the European Union, Antonio Tajani, is under fire for making comments about fascist Italian dictator Benito Mussolini that could be interpreted, interpreted as apologism for fascism. The President is reported to have said on Italian radio that prior to the Second World War, Mussolini built roads, bridges and buildings. Tahani has also re recently been criticized for permitting Spanish ultra-right-wing party Vox hold a conference at the European Parliament. And amidst calls for his resignation, President Tahani took to social media to defend himself following the criticism, saying that he has always been an anti-fascist. That brings us to the end of this news brief, but as you know, you can find these and many other stories on our website at tellusthroughenglish.net. And you can join us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For Tellusthrough English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.